I have a slightly unique and strange reason for enjoying American Gothic and American horror. At least, I think it's unique. Let me know if you understand where I'm coming from. There is something about the atmosphere of American Gothic and American horror that I really enjoy. The world and the setting of American horror makes me feel weirdly comfortable. Especially if you look at any novel set in New England, which is every Stephen King novel. That mix of small town life with unexpected chills and terror makes me feel at ease. And there is something uncanny in that. The idea of a comfortable space, a friendly small town, or an isolated rural home. Somewhere where the characters and the reader by proxy is able to feel kind of relaxed and comfortable and safe. And then the horror starts. And I love that. I love the feeling of being safe until you're not. Until that safety is removed or feels like it was an illusion all along. I really like that aspect of American horror and I never really get bored of it. And that's partly why I enjoyed The Cabin at the End of the World so much. Because it takes that concept and dials it up to 11 in a way that I don't think I've ever seen. Now at the time of recording, Paul Tremblay's The Cabin at the End of the World is about to be released in cinemas as M. Night Shyamalan's new film, Knock at the Cabin, which I've seen the trailer for and it looks pretty good. I hope that it will be because I love this book. I think it's my new favorite American horror novel. Even if the film disappoints, it's got Dave Bautista in it and it'll be nice to spend more time with this story in a different capacity through a different medium. If I have a lot to say about it, maybe I'll do another video on it. That'll be fun. Anywho, before reading this, I had read one other Paul Tremblay novel, which was A Head Full of Ghosts, which he wrote before this one. And that was a twist on the concept of exorcism. It very much poked at the exorcist as a film. And the way that it was written, the sort of method of storytelling was one that I really enjoyed, but it certainly wasn't a frightening novel, at least from where I'm standing. This, this really got to me. The Cabin at the End of the World, gave me a nightmare. I read this book very, very quickly, and when I was about three quarters through, I went to bed and I had a nightmare. And that nightmare had absolutely nothing to do with the novel. The characters, the events, nothing at all. But I had a very chilling and surreal nightmare because this novel had just put me in that headspace, this elevated sense of dread and fear, almost a kind of fight or flight response that I then took with me into dreamland. And what that produced was a nightmare of my own imagining. But what an effect for a novel to have. Anyway, I've talked a lot and I haven't said what it's actually about. The cabin at the end of the world begins with a married couple and their adopted daughter. Eric and Andrew have brought their daughter to a remote cabin in New Hampshire, just a few miles from the Canadian border. They're out in the wilderness and they're having a nice relaxing time. Until their daughter, Wen, is playing just outside the front of the cabin and a man walks towards her down the dirt path. He's an enormous man called Leonard and he's just walked all the way to their cabin and he starts talking to Wen. She's catching grasshoppers and he has a chat with her and he explains to her that she and her dads are going to need to let him into the cabin and that he is bringing with him three other people, and all four of them must be let inside. They're all carrying makeshift weapons from farming tools. They look terrifying. And Leonard says, me and my friends must be let inside. We will not use our weapons to harm you. We do not want to harm you, but you must let us in. And what follows is Eric and Andrew saying, no, of course not get out of here, go away. Being a gay couple, they're already slightly paranoid, feeling vulnerable, wondering if this is some sort of a hate crime. And eventually these four people do get inside the cabin and they tie Eric, Andrew and their daughter up. And then they explain that they need this family's help with preventing the end of the world. That's all I want to say without spoiling anything. And if you watch the trailer for Shyamalan's film adaptation of this, it spoils more than what I just said. And that kind of irritated me because there are some shocking moments in this book. There is a lot of frightening imagery. There are a lot of incredible events and moments that should not even be hinted at, but the trailer does that. 
So I recommend not watching the trailer, read the novel, go watch the film, and just let it surprise you. Because at its core, this is a novel about faith, about cult mentalities, about cynicism. You get the sense right from the moment that Leonard starts talking that he is a cultist. Just from his awkward, reserved, and robotic manner, this guy feels pretty culty. And then he explains that he has these friends, and they need to come into the cabin, and they need help saving the world, and you go, yep, they're a doomsday cult. And then you have Eric and Andrew, a married couple with two very different attitudes. One of them, I think it's Eric, isn't a culty person per se, but he's one of those people that's open to the idea of certain spiritual things, and could be susceptible to believing potentially harmless things like astrology, and more harmful things like a cult. And then you've got Andrew, who is pretty much impervious to any kind of methods of thinking along these lines. Here's what's real, here's what's not, that's the end. And that dynamic between the two of them, while they have a young daughter who is vulnerable and in their care, and whom they love and must look after, that dynamic adds a lot to this narrative. But the fact is, these three people, one of whom is a very young child, are tied up and have to reckon with the fact that what these people are saying might be true, very likely isn't true, and either way, this is bad. If these people are delusional cultists, they are dangerous, potentially murderous people. And if what they're saying happens to be true, that the end of the world is coming and this family can somehow stop it, that's pretty terrible as well. The end of the world is rarely a good thing. And I'm happy to give this away, which is that the entire novel takes place within this cabin, and the kind of land surrounding it. You never go anywhere else except in flashbacks, which serve to flesh out Eric and Andrew as characters, and their relationship, and how they adopted when. All of that is covered in flashbacks, but the events of the novel itself all take place within this cabin. That claustrophobia, going back to what I said at the beginning, the idea of a safe, rural American space, a happy family, vacationing together in New England. All of that, that beautiful setting, that's what I love about American horror, and this novel upends all of that in a stronger, more aggressive way than I've ever seen, even in Stephen King novels. The Cabin at the End of the World really punches the face of Americana, and I'm so impressed by its gall, especially considering cults and cult behavior are stitched into American history as well. Considering from an outside perspective how American Christian behavior often looks extremely cultish, depending on who is talking and what they're believing, you can't get away from the cult-like behavior within the American system, within American society. And this novel explores that as well. I'm so impressed. And going back to what I said about having a nightmare, for a book's sheer claustrophobia and tension to have that kind of an effect on the reader, that's powerful stuff. As I was reading this, I gasped. There was a moment where I let out an enormous gasp, which is not something I do when I read. I don't really physically react to things I'm reading. It's all going on in my head, I'm sure that's true for most people. But I literally gasped. I put my hand to my mouth and I gasped. And my partner was like, what the, what, what the fuck is, what, why, what? Because <laughs> it just doesn't happen. But it happened when I read this. It's amazing how much happens across 300 pages, across a time span of about 24 hours, within a single space. And the thematic conversation that you're having with the novel about what is real, and about faith versus indoctrination, is fascinating. How do we know the difference between having faith in something and being indoctrinated into something that tells you to have faith? There are some big questions going on in this deceptively complex American horror novel. I love when a novel that is a piece of genre fiction is also an exercise in literary discussion. This would not be put in a section marked literary fiction, but the fact that it's had me thinking these things and having chats with myself about these concepts shows that almost any novel has the power to be literary, and I'm so impressed. This is a terrifying, 
very, very clever novel, and I think it's probably my favourite American horror story. And of course now I can't wait to see the film, even if it doesn't hold a candle to this, I'm still going to enjoy it. Just don't watch the trailer. Now it's time for my Patreon book recommendation of the week. This recommendation comes from Danielle Bird, and the novel is Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots. It's a great little story about corporatification of supervillains and superheroes. The novel tracks a would-be henchwoman as she navigates having a job as a hired data analyst for a villain. That sounds like a great novel. I am a huge comic book reader, I don't do it as much as I used to, I wish I still did, and reading a novel about the idea of being a goon for a villain in a satire about corporate life, that, that sounds wonderful. So thank you for that recommendation, Danielle. Alright, check this book out. Go watch the film if you like, I know I will, and subscribe for books.